If you have your Bibles, we invite you to turn to Acts 24. Acts 24, and we'll read all 27 verses. This is Paul before Felix. Acts 24. And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain order named Tertullius, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullius began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and thou that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. We accept if always and in all places most noble Felix with all thankfulness. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee, that thou wast hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also hath gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain Lysias uh, came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take us knowledge of all things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, for as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge into this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that thou mayest understand that they are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for the worship, and they neither have found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogue nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have found hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that they shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise my faith and myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had all against me. Or else let these same here say if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council. Except it be for this one voice that I cried, standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when life is the chief captain shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. And after certain days when Felix with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteous temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given of uh, given him of Paul that he might loose him, wherein wherefore he sent for him the, uh, the oftener and commune with him. But after two years, uh, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. We see here Paul before Felix. We see that he has been in, 
interrogated by the Roman governor uh, Felix. Paul will remain in prison for the rest of his life. We saw last week that he was transported to Caesarea. Uh, and this chapter will open and close with Paul in prison in Caesarea. Now we see there was a plot against Paul. The Jews were taking a vow uh, and they wanted Paul dead. In fact, they were on a hunger strike. Uh, they were not going to eat until Paul uh, was dead. Uh, and they plotted his murder. So they had to bring Paul secretly to Caesarea. Now Paul, way back in the uh, 2311, was assured, and it was Paul's wish to go to Rome. He wanted to go to Rome and to witness to Caesar himself. Well, he's going to go to Rome, but it's going to take two more years before he gets there, and he's going to go in, uh, as a prisoner. Now, Paul, I'm sure, he was human, he had a great faith in God, but I'm sure he had many ups and downs as he uh, was in prison. Perhaps he experienced some depression. The Lord didn't promise him that uh, the way would be easy. Paul would no longer be a free man. He would die in uh, prison. Uh, and we see before his final mark, there was nothing but peril and danger. Actually, if you want to be technical about it, he had been experiencing these things since he was let down uh, in the basket over the wall at Damascus. Now we see Felix uh, reviews the charges against Paul uh, in the first 23 verses. And then in verses 1 through 9, we see the defamation by the prosecution. The Jewish high priest will come there to Caesarea, and he brings with him a lawyer named Tertullius. This Tertullius was a very brilliant, a very clever, and very well-prepared lawyer. There's a lot of lawyer jokes, and I'm not going to try to tell them tonight. But uh, I guess the lawyer, a lawyer could be the best friend you ever have if he helps you. And if you're not helped, you ain't going to like him too good. But anyway, we see uh, the charges, and there's three charges left against Paul. First of all, he is a political rebel, the first five verses. He was uh, being accused of being a fermenter of troubles and a pest. Now in that charge, he is in the same place as insurrections. And the Romans had absolutely no patience with insurrections. Uh, I believe if you look back in the intertestamental period, the 400 years uh, before Jesus came, uh, the, the Jewish revolts there in, the, uh, in that uh, period and the Romans put down many uprisings and we see that finally in 70 AD just as Jesus predicted uh, the temple there in Jerusalem would be destroyed so the Romans did not have any use for civil disorder. People could go along their business, they could practice their religion go about their life, but they did not put up for one minute with insurrection. So Tertullius, uh, he well knew that Rome would not stand for civil disorder, for any spark might become a flame. Now Tertullius, he knew it was a lie, but it was an effective charge. Paul was not guilty of this, but they're going to try to make him look guilty of this. Now second charge he was a reign leader of the Nazarene sect. And Paul was a leader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And uh, there were many movements there. And the Romans uh, knew what havoc or trouble that false messiahs could cause. And they could whip the 
people into hysterical uh, rights. So here again, Claudius uh, <coughs> is trying to levy this charge against him that he is an insurrection. Excuse me, I believe I'm going to have to turn this fan back on. There's a lot of hot air up here, but anyway. And then the third charge, he was a temple defiler, verses 6 through 9. Now the Jews accused him, you know, he brought that uh, Gentile convert, accusing him of bringing him into the temple, which technically was a violation. But they were accusing him of trying to subvert the Jewish uh, religion to defile the temple and so on and so forth. So Tertullius hoped that uh, uh, here uh, the, the, uh, those would take the side of the pro-Roman party. So we see the three charges against Paul. First of all, he's a mover of sedition. He is a leader of a rebellious sect and he profaned the temple. So here are the charges, and now Paul will answer with his defense. Now, Paul is saying that he is delighted uh, to present his case before Felix. He knows that Felix has been a judge uh, of the people for a long time. He understood, Felix understood their customs, and Paul responds. Now, first of all, he says... Uh, he denies the first and the third charges. And since Felix understands the customs of the Jews, Paul tells him that he went up to Jerusalem there to worship according to their custom. So in substance he's saying, I am in agreement with my nation. <coughs> Only I must confess that the way which I worship God is to them heresy. Uh, so Paul makes it clear that the way in which he worships is according to the message of the, his fathers in the Old Testament. And he, he affirms the second charge there in uh, verses uh, 14 and uh, 21. Now we see uh, the deference of the politician there are 22 and 23, not, you know, willing to offend the high priest. Felix promises to render him buried at a later date. Now, secondly, Felix refuses the Christ of Paul. Now, both the governor, Felix, and his wife, Drusilla, have a private meeting with Paul. And we see his thing. He speaks to them about righteousness and future judgment. Now the Bible says there uh, in uh, verse 25 uh, Felix trembled. So Paul has Felix's attention. He knows, Felix knows of Christianity, in which it was called the way in that day. Uh, but he, he says, Paul, I hear what you're saying. Come back to me at a more convenient time. I want to say tonight, for the sinner, there is no uh, other convenient time. The Bible says, Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now you could argue that this is really not Paul answering these charges. You could argue that Paul is using this opportunity to witness to Felix, to tell him of the gospel. This was Paul's main goal to tell of the Savior. Now Felix... He was a freed slave, and through brutality and cruelty, he had risen to his position. 
In fact, his name literally means pleasure. He was given over to licentiousness. And uh, his wife, she's an interesting character, Drusilla, she was the daughter of Herod Agrippa I. Now he had, if you remember back in our study in the earlier part of Acts, he had James the Apostle, James the brother of our Lord, he had him executed. So he was not a good guy. Those Herods were not good men. If you go all the way back to Herod the Great and you study the history, he was very brutal. Uh, in fact, I think, if I remember, it, some of them said it was safer to be Herod's pig than his son because he had, he had his family killed and some, uh, something was going on all the time. Now, her great uncle had John the Baptist executed. Felix and Drusilla, you've heard the old saying, were in the catbird seat. They had the best opportunity to hear about Jesus. They were in the position, um, they, were, they had the very best, most favorable opportunity to hear the gospel. And they had one of the most favorable opportunities under favorable circumstances. They have here a private interview with the greatest preacher of the grace of God that the world has ever known. God gives them a private sermon. Their palace becomes a church and their thrones become almost a mourner's bench. Oh, the grace of God. To give these two, these two pagans, a chance. And I believe that God in His love and in His grace will give every one of us a chance, the opportunity to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. But unfortunately, we do not read that these two did that. If they did, the Bible doesn't tell us about it. This is a fulfillment of a verse back in Psalms 2, verse 10. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Now, I believe they had a great deal of interest in hearing about Jesus. And I believe that, they, that Felix, perhaps Drusilla, might have made a decision for the Lord. And Paul reasoned, them, reasoned with them about righteousness, temperance, and judgment. Of course, he's talking here about the righteousness of the law. And we, man cannot attain. The law, as we've been studying in the book of Romans, declares or reveals that man is a sinner. He cannot even present a legal righteousness that would be acceptable to God. In order to get to hell, you've got to have the righteousness of God. Ours won't do. Ours is self-righteousness. All we we think we're good, we act good, but we're really not. And you know what the Bible says, that uh, our righteousness is as his filthy rage, no good thing dwelleth with it. And also, something has to be done with the sin problem. That absolutely cannot be glossed over. For God to remain righteousness, the righteous and holy. Either our sins have to be uh, put on Jesus in his death by his blood, or they're on us 
to pay for eternally and there is no way that that could ever be repaid. So Paul is, is telling uh, here uh, that, they, that they will need the righteousness of God. He reasoned here with Felix about the righteousness of the law which could not, he could not need in the righteousness which Christ provides the sinner and puts, uh, who puts his trust in. And then he talks about temperance and self-control. And Felix here was mastered by passion and cruelty. These two, Felix and Drusel, they, you know, they thought they were free. They thought they were in good shape. But God spoke to them about the judgment to come, which is the final judgment, of course, in Revelation 20, the uh, great white throne judgment. There is a judgment to come, and just as Paul preached to Felix and Drusilla 2,000 years ago, the same is still true. There is the judgment to come. Sinners will be judged. That's not a change. Now statistically, reaching people for Christ, statistically the younger that you are, the more likely you're going to come to the Lord. Now I'm not saying it's impossible for an old person to come to the Lord. You hear of deathbed repentance, you hear of people being saved as they get older. That's certainly possible. But it's less and less likely because as we get older we get soft in our ways. There's a story that J. Vernon McGee told about Dr. George W. Truett. Dr. George W. Truett was a great man in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, he was born just over the mountain in Hayesville, North Carolina. And uh, in fact, one of our Baptist camps over there, Truett, is his name for Dr. Truett. And he he went to Texas, went to Baylor, uh, and he was uh, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, I believe for 40 years, and I uh, believe president of the Southern Baptist Convention. But Dr. McGee tells uh, about uh, an occasion uh, concerning his 50th anniversary. Um, there was a lawyer that was talking to Dr. Truett there at his uh, anniversary celebration. He was not a Christian. And uh, the lawyer said, George, you and I came to Dallas about the same time. You were a young preacher and I was a young lawyer. And he said, I must confess when I first heard you, uh, I was moved a great deal by your sermons. He said, very frankly, there was nights I couldn't sleep. But he says, as the years wore on, the day came when I would listen to you and enjoy hearing you. Your message didn't disturb me at all. And he said, now you're a much better preacher than you were then. The lawyer chuckled about it, but he didn't realize how tragic it, it was. He didn't realize the place to which he had actually come. He said, as Felix, go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season. I will call for thee, said Felix. We don't read that that time ever came for Felix or from that lawyer there in Texas. God gives us a chance to come to him. God gives us a chance to be saved. But we can turn God down. We have the power of free will. We have the choice. God will only deal with a man so long. And then that the still small voice just you can't hear it. 
So these two, you know, you talk about the greatest of opportunity to hear the gospel. Now they were in the catbird seat. And I believe they blew it. We don't read that they ever came to glory. Well, finally, Felix requests some cash from Paul. He wants to try to bribe Paul for the next two years. He keeps him in prison. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he wanted to bribe Paul maybe to rescind his stand and rescind his message. We see here that Felix played politics to the very end. He left Paul in prison. And we see that Roman justice was no better than the men who executed him. Either Paul was guilty or he wasn't guilty. And if he was guilty of treason, he should have been put to death. If not, he should have been freed. One or the other should have been done. Under no circumstances should he have been left in prison for two years. Now that's the way man looks at it. But God, you know, had a purpose for Paul being in prison. Number two.